Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 247, we're going to try and answer the question, is tube burn-in real? But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, I hate clickbait, so I'll give you the answer up front. No, yes, maybe, depends, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on what you consider burn-in to actually be, and we'll get into that. Okay, so what, what could burn-in possibly be doing? When a tube is newly manufactured, it needs to be burnt in to fully activate the cathode coating. Quality manufacturers like Philips and all of their subsidiaries, notably Mullard, had huge burn-in racks where newly manufactured tubes were gradually brought up to temperature and then the filament voltage was brought up to 10% over voltage. This process did a number of things. First, it verified the tube was working, and the elevated filament voltage provided a wee stress test for the filament. Without a good working filament, of course, you've got nothing. It also helped seat the new assembly inside. If you've ever heard a quick loud pop or creak on startup of a new tube, that's the internal parts adjusting, often right after being shipped. That generally will only happen once. Unless, of course, you ship the tube again. <laughs> or if it's been sitting for a really long time between startups. Yeah, if it's been cycling, um, you know, minus 20C and plus 20C for 20 years, it, it probably will have adjusted itself as well. Now, most importantly, burn-in renews the cathode coating. When tubes are manufactured, the cathode gets a special coating that essentially is the source supply of electrons that the tube operates with. And what that, that coating is designed to be continuously recycled back to the cathode. This is called cathode regeneration. Now, by the time you receive your tubes from us, or any quality vintage tube seller, the tube has been run at least twice, once to test electrically and once to test for noise issues and to verify quality sound. So if the cathode needed to be run for a bit, that's probably already been done. In our experience, handling thousands of tubes every year, we've almost never heard a tube improve with more operating time. Though occasionally we see tubes that aren't operating properly benefit by a short burn-in period for of a few minutes. Okay, now there is actually one other thing that can happen here along with the cathode regeneration and that's the reaction of gas inside the tube. You don't want gas in your tube, but you always inevitably end up with some particles floating around in there. That's the purpose of the getter. Here's the getter ring from a 7F7 tube that we've removed. And this contains a gas absorbing metal that gets flashed off and it's designed to absorb those particles. But yeah. it can't do that if the particles aren't heated up and floating around inside the partial vacuum. So what happens is, is if you let a tube sit for too long, any of those gas particles in there will settle on the different components, including the cathode. And they'll cause small imperfections in the surface that need to get burned off with time. And sometimes that can cause a little bit of noise or a little bit of a loss in performance. And just running them for a while after they've you know, been sitting for 60 to 80 years <laughs> gets them back up and working correctly. Okay, now is this a good time to, for you to show off to your components? Yeah, okay, so I just pulled this guy apart here. This is part of a dead 7F7 tube. Here's one half of the or one of the two triodes that are still mostly intact here so you can get a good look at it and you can see the internal structure we've got our plate which is the largest component in here inside that we have a couple of posts with a very fine grid wire wound around it we'll take a look at one of them removed in a second and internal to that is the cathode which is this very thin post with a heater wire 
that is tucked inside of it because you have to heat up the cathode in order for it to expel electrons towards the grid and the plate. So we've taken apart the second triode here into its major components and from the inside to the outside we have our cathode and you can see the special coating right here. It's actually a little bit blurry, kind of hard to tell. Sorry, it's a small component. <laughs> but this is very, very fragile, powdery. If I rub this a little bit here, you can see that coating is coming right off. And inside this, there's the heater wire and it's even more fragile. It looks like the thickness of a human hair. Next to it, we have our grid, which is a very fine, evenly spaced winding on a couple of posts. And then we have our cathode. And now gas can uh, stick no, to all of these. Oh, sorry, our anode. <laughs> yeah, so the anode is very commonly called the plate mm -hmm. um, for obvious assemblies uh, reasons because it, it looks like a plate assembly. So one other thing too that I forgot to mention earlier is that the mica spacers, which are commonly used in the vast majority of tubes, actually do a little bit of off-gassing themselves. And if you read data sheets for things like uh, high-end Bendix tubes that use ceramics instead of micas, they explain that they use the ceramics to avoid the off-gassing issues that mica uh, uh, spacers um, introduce. So, I mean, in the vast majority of cases, this isn't going to be a problem. But in very high-end tube situations, we're talking, you know, military, industrial, uh, they wanted to make sure that it w definitely wasn't going to be a problem. Yeah, and some tubes, some high-powered uh, specialist tubes uh, have huge micas or huge, huge spacing wafers would be a better way to term it. So now you've got a lot more potential for producing um, small amounts of, of unwanted um, elements into the actual vacuum. They'll also oftentimes have much more gettering, multiple getter rings, multiple different types of getter materials as well that operate in different ways. Oh, some tubes will have a pair of getters at the waist, a getter at the bottom, and a, a couple of getters on the top. And that makes sense if they're really, if the specs of the tube require that the vacuum is absolutely 100% or as close as you can get. You, you're going to have to try and grab any stray molecules that are inside that vacuum and trap them, which of course is what the gathering does. Okay, now I can hear a bunch of you frantically typing comments along the lines of, I've heard it. The sound definitely changes with time. And this is true. Your perception of change is real. To understand how that works, you've got to remember we hear sound thanks to an ear-brain interface. That interface learns from every listening experience, but when a sound is brand new to us, we're still thinking about it, even though we've actually heard it. Well, so the very first listen is like a fresh bit of data. By the time we've been listening for a week, we have now learned the new sound, and to us, it is different. Maybe better, maybe worse, but I think because it is our new normal, we hear it as better. Now, this is sort of pieced together from what I've learned over the years um, from people who do research on uh, how we actually hear things. And the human brain is really fascinating because it functions except basically as a, a very um, complex um, set of memories and um, experiences that it uses to essentially guess or uh, predict <laughs> or predict what's going to happen next. Yeah, and that happens in particular with our vision and our other senses quite a bit as well. So there's, you know, optical illusions are a thing, sound illusions are a thing, and, uh, and our perception of these things can change with time. Now, it's always possible that you've got a tube that was not properly burned in at the factory, that was not tested and burned in later on by, um, by the seller, and yeah, those tubes may well benefit from a very short burn-in period, perhaps a couple of minutes, maybe 20 minutes at the absolute outside, depending on the size of the, of the tube. 
but a burn-in of 24 hours straight, um, even with white noise applied, I honestly can't imagine a situation where that would make a difference, though you commonly see that in recommendations. So I think the, um, I think the moral of the story is listen um, critically when you have, when you've rolled in a new tube with the thought that, wait a minute, I have to actually think past what my expectations are of the sound and just simply expect something uh, completely different than I'm used to. So as uh, critical listeners, um, with a lot of experience, we listen to a lot of prototype equipment, a lot of new tubes we have to listen to, and we, we, we have, we've got enough experience critically listening that we can, most of the time we can, um, we can walk, we can sort of walk outside of our normal listening experience and listen to something very fresh with a sort of with a, a blank slate as to what to expect. And with that in mind, then you can actually critically uh, analyze the tube. And if you get to that point of listening, you may well find that the tube, in fact, does not change later on because you really captured a, a, good, um, a good assessment of what you were hearing initially. And that's not something we, we really see. We do a lot of listening of a lot of different types, and we've never noticed a difference uh, from letting something run longer term compared to how it sounded originally. Yeah, and I think in the future we should do one on equipment burn-in as well. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. So, I mean... it's a whole other topic. I mean, similar, but... <laughs> yeah, but we do, do, we do a lot of... Well, we do a lot of burn-in of brand new equipment because we build a lot of equipment. Yep. and uh, I need to run it. Yeah, so maybe we'll do an episode in a future date. But right now, Charles, you've got, uh, I think, a, one of our favorite 6SN7s came back. Uh, we got some more stock in. Yeah, let's go take a look. Okay, well, these are some of our favorite reasonably affordable vintage 6SN7 GTA or GTBs. Yeah, well, actually, I'm mean, technically they are the 6N8S or 6H8C, depending on if you're looking at them in Cyrillic or the English alphabet. And uh, these are the Photons, the lovely uh, Photon 6SN7 equivalents, and we have actually two different versions of them here. But first, caution everyone, there is actually a later version that Photon made mm -hmm. that uses a saucer getter. Yeah, and an NEVZ made too that looks nearly identical. They have a shorter base on them that also has a saucer getter, and they do not sound or perform anywhere near as good as these guys. Yeah, in fact, they're, they're pretty meh. Yeah. So this is the, I would call maybe the second last version or third earliest version, depending on how you want to look at it, of these photons. They really didn't change very much. But there is an earlier one which has a ribbed, slightly ribbed plate, and an even earlier one with the ribbed plate and some metal straps on here that we've shown before. They're incredibly rare. But this one still has the cutouts on the mica where those straps went, but this is dated from 1962. And funny enough, we actually have a 1963, I think it's right here. And this is the last version that was made other than the saucer getters. And this is actually great because you can actually see right through the tube at the plate getter. Yeah. From the other side. If you turn it around, you can see the gettering. There's that flashing right there. Yeah. So that's the cutoff date, we think, for the, this mica change. 1962 to 1963 is somewhere in that period where they've changed it here. And the cutoff date when they went over to the saucer getter happened in, I think, the years 1967 and 68. So there actually were some tubes in 67 and 68 that had saucer getters mm -hmm. and some that still had the bottom foil getter. And the bottom foil getter is absolutely the tube you want. But the, it's not surprising, is it? Because the in general, this is a very general rule. It's not an absolute rule. The earlier the tube was made, the better it sounds. Yeah, and the more likely they were to have these, these plate style or foil style getters. I'm not sure why they replaced them later on. It could have been um, maybe material sciences changed or they were trying to save on materials. But um, something about these early foil getter ones. Maybe it's just because they're early, <laughs> but they sound fantastic. And these are great sounding tubes. Um, 
We actually had a batch of them come in not long ago where uh, we were sent a pile of junk, but thankfully that was followed up by an absolutely beautiful testing pile, and this is part of that. Yeah, and warning everyone, um, we're in, uh, in the northern hemisphere, we're in summer vacation time. There's two big times of the year in which the crooks and thieves and um, uh, snake oil salesmen appear online, and that is the midsummer uh, the, and and the Christmas break. There, and it, it happens every year like this, and I think I suspect they're just looking for some vacation money, <laughs> your money for their vacation. And uh, they, they have no moral backbone whatsoever. They will send a bunch of junk for your cash. And, and then they'll actually have the nerve to tell you that you have no idea how to test a tube. So, um, yeah, so just be really careful. One of the big problems that we're facing is um, a lot of, um, a lot of w whenever we're buying tubes from someone new, uh, we have to rely on uh, reviews going back over the years. And unfortunately, many sites allow the actual seller to manipulate the reviews. So reviews don't um, tell you everything. Yeah, especially in this day and age where a lot of reviews can be bought or, um, or artificially boosted in some way. And uh, just be wary of that. Look, look for things that look fake. Look for accounts that are suspicious. And, um, you know, just have some common sense whenever you're buying and be careful. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for showing those off, Charles. Um, oh, and I should mention we have at least, I think, seven or eight really nice pairs of these in the store if you're interested in them. And if you want um, the slightly earlier version, just put a note in the comment and we'll make sure we send those off for you. Otherwise, we'll send the best tubes we have. Yeah, which is how we always operate. And the, we always grade tubes uh, in three different ways. The first way is the electrical testing data that we have on the tube. That is paramount in our opinion. Second, we will, um, we will match tubes um, cosmetically as much as possible. And the last thing we do is date match because a lot of tubes um, are made um, ex pretty much exactly the same from one production run to another. And in particular, the Soviet tubes. Yeah, it's really unusual for any Soviet era tube to actually change uh, from even from a decade to another decade. Yeah. Now, these are a little bit of an exception, but they still didn't change that much over around maybe 20 to 30 years of production. Yeah, I think there's just basically the one variant um, in the early years anyways. And then if we count the saucer, three three variants from about, what, 1950 to 1980, so... Yeah, and the small change in the mica, which is hardly, you know, much yeah. of a variant, but we still do match for that. Yeah. Okay, well, if you stayed this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. Uh, we can do flat rate shipping around the world for almost everybody, but if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. And if, talking about discounts, there's some discounts that are pretty pretty easy to grab, and there's one that's pretty easy to figure out that everybody gets that is really logical. That's about as much of a hint as I'm going to give because it <laughs> costs us a lot of money every year. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.